Hello and welcome to Oslo, the capital of Norway. Over the next week or so, I'll be speaking to the region's biggest banks and hedge funds. Whilst much of Europe is implementing austerity, the situation in Norway is very different. It's not in the euro, it's not in the EU, and its oil wealth has contributed to an unemployment rate of just 3%. And a symbol of its prosperity is this, the Oslo Opera House, which was built for a cost of $700 million. Now, I've been speaking to Harald Magnus Andreasen from Swedbank First Securities about both the Eurozone and Norwegian economies. I've just had a very nice walk to this office. I walked down the main shopping street. There's lots of people doing their Christmas shopping. I uh, also walked past the bars and the restaurants there filling up. And this area we're now, now is pretty magnificent as well. So would it be fair to say that Norwegians are having it pretty good at the moment compared to the rest of Europe? Well, at least compared to some countries in Europe. I mean, unemployment rate is down to 3%. Uh, and in some countries uh, they are far worse off, like 25% in Spain and Greece. But still, I mean, Germany has an unemployment rate that is slightly above 5%. So it's not that unique in Europe that the labour market is strong. This might seem a slightly strange question, but if unemployment rates at 3%, is that too low? Because there's this argument that there should be a slightly more unemployment. Well, I'd still wage inflation is at 4%. And of course, that's a bit too high compared to other countries today. Um, but over time, 4% in wage inflation is not that, that much. We got an inflation target at 25 And normally, uh, productivity is increasing by more than 1.5%. So 4% is in fact a bit too low if you want to achieve 2.5% inflation, which is the inflation target. But I think the target is a bit too high. And I think that wage inflation perhaps is somewhat too high if you take from a cost basis and compare to the, our competitors. But I think the, uh, the, the, the Norwegian market, labor market, is, is very, it's a strange market. It's, and I think it's pretty well organized. If you take the long-term averages between unemployment and wage inflation, Norway has the best Phillips curve in the sense that we do not need high unemployment in order to get wage inflation down. I think the reason is that the trade unions are quite responsible. They're not behaving like we have seen in some other European countries. So if there's just a whisper about the possibility of higher unemployment due to a slowdown in the business cycle, then the trade unions say, of course, we want to, to be moderate. We want to, to keep to get in wage inflation down. And they have, have done so repeatedly. So we don't, have to, we don't need a high unemployment rate in order to have a normal wage inflation over time. Clearly, Norway is in a slightly unique position in Europe in that it has huge natural resources. Um, but does that insulate it from what's going on in the rest of the world economy? No, it, it doesn't. And, and normally the business cycle in Norway is quite similar to the business cycle abroad. That's not mainly through the trade channel that exports, of course, partly due to exports uh, and, and import competition. But the main reason why the business cycles usually are quite similar is that we are doing the same things as people and banks and companies in other countries. So in good times, people are optimistic, the banks are optimistic and, and, and the economy is booming. And in fact, we had a quite sharp slowdown during the financial crisis and we had a recession in Norway too. Uh, with a, a contraction in GDP not seen in more than 20 years. And people think that was due to the crisis abroad. But if you look at the figures, net exports from Norway grew. Okay, exports, they slowed down. But imports fell much more due to the decline, a sharp decline in domestic demand. I think for the first time in history, we have seen a country um, got a windfall gain from natural resources without spending a lot of that money, at least within a democracy. Uh, what the politicians in Norway have done, I think is quite impressive. So, so things in Norway obviously are, are pretty healthy. Um, what about across the border in Sweden? It's in a very different situation. It's in the EU, but obviously out of the Eurozone. Um, but there are, aren't there signs that Sweden's getting dragged into the Eurozone crisis more and more. Yeah, and that's because Sweden is exporting more capital goods and producing and exporting capital goods. We don't 
that part of the industry, manufacturing industry, is not that large in Norway. In fact, Norway is more connected to the global economy in which China has been the most important player over the past the last decade, while Sweden is still more exposed to their closer trading partners with the goods they are producing. So we can we can see some signs now that in that exports from Sweden are slowing down and yes, well, quite dramatic fall in, in manufacturing production in September and, and the business services are quite downbeat. Um, over the past years, if you take it from before the crisis until now, Sweden has been quite successful. They had a huge decline in GDP during the financial crisis, some 7-8% down, but they are now up to where they came from. And if you take it per capita, per inhabitant in Sweden and Norway, they have followed if you compare it to before the crisis until now, we are almost at the same level. And that's, um, uh, even though some fundamentals are better in Norway, we got 3% unemployment, whilst it almost 8% now in Sweden. So there are differentials, but some macro news or macro development has been quite satisfactory in Sweden too. Again, the decisions about Greece, the EU budget mm. as well, they're just being pushed further down the line. Do you have any expectations for the eurozone problems, the fundamental eurozone problems, to be solved anytime soon. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Do you have more questions? <laughs> uh, I think it's. I'm a bit less pessimistic than most others. So perhaps slightly optimistic. Uh, the main reason for that is that already a quite a lot has been happening, and I think the most important thing is the whole euro model has been redrawn uh, over the past year. It started with a fiscal compact, it went on with the banking union in April to, to June, and of course uh, during the summer, uh, June, July and August, decision by the ECB to be able to support countries that needed help. Uh, they haven't asked for it yet, like Spain, but I think they will. So, so if we're sat here again this time <coughs> next year, what do you think the situation is going to be, that we're on the verge of some proper yeah, concerted growth? That's, the, that, that's a very good question again. I. My, my best wishes for the next year <laughs> would certainly be that we'll see uh, that unemployment will not increase that much anymore. We, see a, we can eye a peak at unemployment rates. Um, export from the Eurozone is now record high. The Eurozone is running a current account, account surplus and the currency is, well, historically not versus the dollar, but trade weighted is a quite low, it, it, it's quite cheap, so it's quite competitive. Uh, and I think we'll see further strengthening of the southern countries on their current account side. And that implies higher production over time. And I think we'll see that the cost level has come down so far. And the companies have learned in the south how to get out, how to export. Uh, so they will get, get some more stimulus from higher net exports. Um, but we need to see that during the next 12 months. If there are no signs of anything getting better, something will happen on the policy side. Well, that's all for now. Next time we'll be hearing from Ole Andrei Shenru, who will be discussing China, but from also Opera House, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>